I think I am on. Um, and first I wanted to light a candle. To help us hold our space. And for those who can't be with us, but who will join us later. And I wanted to thank Hazel and everyone else for coming today. But particularly Hazel, I've had the opportunity of being in a few different um, basic exercise groups with her. And um, it has been such a joy for me. I found her to be um, just an enthralling woman in that um, she has this incredible sanguinity that is able to connect all of these disparate um, dots all about and bring them into a cohesive, a cohesive whole, which is something that's a very clerically sanguine person I really admire. Um, she also has traveled the world. Um, she has studied almost everything and deeply followed all of her interests and is a mother as well and discovered anthroposophy actually in college through Owen Barfield. Um, which was a remarkable way, of, uh, my husband did the same, but it was a remarkable way to enter into anthroposophy through the power of the word. Um, so thank you, Hazel. And we look forward to learning more about what is guiding us here in America. Thank, thank you so much, Lord. Yes, it's been a, a, a pleasure to work with you as well and all the friends in Applied Anthroposophy and, and all the different endeavors going on in the world. And yes, greetings, dear friends. Columbia is calling. She's calling the soul of not only America, but the very heart and soul of humanity. We can feel this, this calling that's coming from the past, the present and the future. And to get us started, I'd, I would like to invite uh, a local friend from the Baltimore area. Richard Swirling is, is going to start us off by, by sharing a little, little taste from the, the Leaves of Grass by, by Walt Whitman. And um, maybe before you start, Richard, you could, you could share your the wonderful t-shirt that you're wearing. I think it's, it's quite wonderful. You might want to pin him so that everyone could see it. And then you'll have to unmute. Perfect. Thank you. As I sat alone by blue Ontario's shore, as I mused of these mighty days and of peace returned and the dead that return no more. A goddess, gigantic, superb, with humble visage accosted me. Chant me the poem, it said, that comes from the soul of America. Chant me the carol of victory and strike up the marches of Libertad. Marches more powerful yet. And sing me before you go the song of the throes of democracy. Beautiful. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, Whitman really, really captured the essence of how the spiritual world is seeking to co-create with us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, Whitman really captured the essence of, of how the, the spiritual world is, is seeking to co-create with us. And I think the time is now to, to cultivate some, some hindsight from our 2020 vision, to begin to read between the lines, to develop keen insight into the, the deep core beyond the cause and effect into the, the individual and collective karma of our ongoing world crisis. Friends, we, we can't be the passive ones. 
letting the blind lead the blind or, or the, the Pollyanna people, nor the, the doomsayers. We, we have to remove the blindfold from justice to, to stand in our uprightness with clear vision. And like Joan of Arc to say, I am not afraid. I was born to do this. Then we will be open to receive those, those divine influences that await our participation. And you know what? <laughs> the one thing that we can always count on is change. You know, I remember in my, my younger days, I, I would often lament about how much better things were, you know, back then, more pastoral or, you know, in ancient times, more pure, more spiritual. And of course, it's great to, to value and, and learn from the past, but we can never stay there. We must adapt and grow and evolve. Change is constant. And it's not always neat or kind, <laughs> but, but how can we live into our evolution? How can, we, how can we manifest change? How do we choose to see things, you know, it, it, from different perspectives? And we don't want to repeat the past genocide that we saw devastate the First Nation peoples. We, don't want to perpetuate war, civil or worldwide to get ahead. We know that in the name of progress, human beings have committed atrocities. But we don't want to blame and shame or separate into factions or single issue platforms either, right? That's, that's the old way. The question is, can we evolve into what the age of the consciousness so calls for? What the time spirit Michael, the son of the Sophia represents, which is part of the mission of America, to be cosmopolitan. So what does that mean? Well, for me, it, it can be seen in the ideal of what we say when we call America the, the melting pot, where all the people that, that make up the folk spirit of a nation are free and equal. So what resources can we, can we draw on? How can we inspire and conspire? Yeah, I'm, breathing, I'm, I'm using breathing metaphors because we do, we have to breathe new life into the best possible future for ourselves, for each other, and for our America, for, for Gaia, our Mother Earth, in harmony with the spiritual beings of the universe that seek to work within us and through us. So today, we're gonna to be taking a peek behind the many forces of history so that we can renew a hidden essence that that holds the key to healing, to help us move forward with our, with, our, with our focused will. And ask ourselves, you know, what is the history that we will sow? S-E-W, S-O-W, you know, as we move into this hundred year anniversary of the refounding of the, of the Anthroposophical Society. We're, we're in it right now. How can we, as anthroposophers, exert our wisdom fortified free will to create a reality that, that brings out the best in ourselves as Americans, in, as in our neighbors, and in the whole wide world web, right, of humanity, while also applying graceful ways of riding as well as guiding the tides of, of destiny? So our work today is to awaken our dormant willpower by aligning us with the impulse of the divine feminine that greatly informs us in the past and who awaits 
those who can hear the true call of freedom, the clarion call to we the people who will to reclaim and, and renew each in our own way, our spirit of place and build together a, a divine destiny where the being of America is healed and, and made whole. So in a bit, we're gonna explore this with, with Lisa Dalton. So yes, today we're gonna to go deep, we're gonna go wide, we have a lot to cover. And, but you know what? <laughs> for some, it may be too dense. And for others, maybe you're gonna wish that I went into this or that further. But I just wanna say that, that our team really sees this as a beginning to a conversation that each of us must add to. So that, you know, if you don't hear something that you feel is important, maybe that's an, uh, a calling to you to take that up as an initiative. So we can really just all of us add to this conversation. So that, that being said, uh, among other things, we will explore the concept from spiritual science of the folk spirit of America, as seen from the perspective of the native peoples, as well as those that came here to escape oppression, including the vision of the founding fathers inscribed through the symbols of Freemasonry in the capital, and ask how do we renew this being of America for our age of the consciousness soul. For we are meant to prepare now for the unveiling of the new Isis Sophia, which will have its full expression in the future seventh epoch, so that we might fulfill the true destiny of America, which plays a significant role in that coming age. But it's, it's the present that we still have to unwrap, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're right here right now. So let's, let's broadcast seeds of, of this intention you know, out into the ethers today. You know, we can look up, we can look out, we can look in and down, and we can follow the, the clues that are, that are etched into the land itself. The, the empty furrows that sound out from the urban food deserts, crying for the amber waves of grain to be reaped in biodynamic fields, alive with cosmic and earthly forces, right? We can, we can till the soil of our hearts by taking up the torch of enlightenment given to us by spiritual science to blaze a trail into regeneration. And yeah, we are still in the Easter time. We are in the midst of this mystery of the 40 days between Easter and Ascension. When the disciples received the esoteric teachings from the risen Christ, we're in that time right now. And then at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, the wisdom of the Sophia descends like tongues of fire to empower them to take up their tasks, bringing the gifts they received from the Holy Spirit into the world. So I guess that's, that's gonna be my little introduction, uh, you know, to, to really, you know, that we could be guided by some of these inspirations. And, so I really like to begin by, by painting a picture of a little known individual that took up her task. A woman who heard Columbia calling and who upheld the torch of liberty despite spending so much of her life as a slave. A woman who was a vessel for the folk spirit of America, who through her writing, awoke that spirit in others. 
I'm talking about Phyllis Wheatley. She was the first African-American and the second woman ever to publish a book of poems in America. Phyllis Wheatley's writing style embraced her heritage where women told stories, right? They told stories as part of the, the festival rites. And so she brought these gifts to America where she, she embraced the Christ principle. And throughout the American Revolution, Phyllis used her artistic talent to actively oppose slavery. She wrote several pieces on liberty and freedom. And she sent them to ministers and, and others in positions of power. And during the peak of her writing career, she published a well-received poem predicting the appointment of George Washington as the commander of the Continental Army. Now, to give the perspective here, we have to remember that at the start of the American Revolution, George Washington was, he was considered old. He was already retired from the army. And he had said, no, he didn't want to be the commander. But her poem entitled, To His Excellency General Washington, helped convince him to take up the reins once again. And then of course he went on to become the first president of the United States of America. So Phyllis Wheatley's prophetic poem also gave us, it gave the name uh, to this inspiration that was uniting the, and driving the colonies toward this independence. She, she named Columbia. She begins this poem by calling in the guardian, this, this guarding uh, folk spirit of America, who she calls Columbia. And so I'd like to invite Desmond Clark to read this quote. Maybe we could pin her video so we can, we can see her as she reads this very powerful quote from Phyllis Wheatley. Ms. Desmond? Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light. Columbia's scenes of glorious toils, I write. While freedom's cause her ancient breast alarms, she flashes inspiration in refugiant arms. See Mother Earth, her offspring's fate bemoan, and nations gaze at scenes never before unknown. See the bright beams of heaven's revolving light, standing up to sorrows and veil of night. The goddess comes, <laughs> ah, the goddess comes and she moves divinely fair. Olive and laurel binds her golden hair. Whenever shines this native of the skies, unnumbered charms and recent graces rise. I got chill bumps. Thank you, Ms. Desmond, awesome, yes. So after these inspiring opening stanzas, the poem goes on to give a prediction of the impending meeting between Columbia and Britannia, the spirit of England. And I love these, these cartoons, there's so many of them. You know, sometimes they, they, they appear to be fighting, other times they're totally like sisters. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see. Um, you can see they're embracing in some of them and the, the different symbolism that they represent. Quite, quite interesting to, to look into that. And I, I really like this one because um, it has the two of them conversing and they, it's called the men of business. So Columbia says, ah, dear, if your man of business had only been less mealy mouthed. And then Britannia says, Yes, dear, and if your man of business had only been less <clears throat> smart, we could have settled the matter pleasantly enough. <laughs> so we can see that there's a lot of forces going on behind the scenes, right? 
that uh, that these these guardians are are witnessing in a way, right? So besides in the poem talking about this meeting, her poem shares a vision of a cosmic alignment that would determine the climax of the war when, quote, the scales of Libra are held aloft by Jupiter. That's a, a quote from the, from the poem where she is describing how these scales are then tipping, that the side of Britannia starts to sink down, that the British attack is crushed. And that is exactly what happened on October 19th of 1781 at Yorktown, the decisive victory assisted by the French army, army which it actually occurred at that exact moment when the planet Jupiter, symbol of the benevolent ruler, was in the constellation of Libra, the zodiac sign pictured as Lady Justice holding the scales. Wow. I mean, we know that in ancient times, human beings were able to speak with the stars, interpreting the signs revealed in the alignments between the planets and constellations. And it seems that Phyllis still had that gift of reading the starry script. Also interesting to note that the founding fathers, when they designed and built the capital, used sacred geometry in alignment with the stars. And in particular, the constellation of Virgo, symbol of the divine feminine. So we're gonna go into that a little bit more. But Phyllis's poem concludes with a petition to serve the goddess and a vision of the honors that Washington would receive as a, as a consequence of his, his faithfulness to Columbia's service. So I wanna bring back Miss Desmond, will you do the honors? Proceed, great chief, with virtue by thy side, thy every action, let the goddess guide, a crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine, with gold unfading, Washington, be thine. Yeah, I love, how this poem captures the imagination of the folk spirit of America working through Wheatley, working through Miss Desmond, right? To reach Washington. And it, it did, it affected him deeply. And it turned the tide in his decision to take up the call of Columbia. He replied and actually invited her to come to Cambridge to visit him and recite her poems at the the command post of the Continental Army, which he decided to take charge of. So George Washington, even though he was a, a Mason of, of high rank, he was a humble man. So he, he shied away from much of the acolytes that he received for his valor. And yet the people were compelled to build many monuments to him and to the spirit of America that he served. For instance, we have the 333-foot George Washington Masonic National Ma Memorial, which is fashioned after the, the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria in Egypt. 333. Okay. And there's many, many depictions of Washington and other of the founding fathers in the Masonic garb. A lot of hidden symbolism there. And this one is great because it, it actually depicts Washington laying the foundation stone of the Capitol building on which the statue of the spirit of freedom stands in her visage as a Native American queen, which we're gonna talk about that in, in more detail shortly. So to lead up to that, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little, little art history. I think that's called for here. Because this fresco, this is a, a close up of the fresco that's high up in the eye of the rotunda 
of the U.S. Capitol building, right underneath that statue. And it's called the Apotheosis of Washington. And it depicts Phyllis Wheatley's prophetic vision of George Washington as the father of our country, rising to the heavens in glory, flanked by female figures representing liberty and victory, encircled by the zodiac, representing the spirits of the original 13 colonies, looking down from the, the starry firmament. And so this word, apotheosis, it means the perfect example, the, being able to achieve elevation to divine status. So this is a painting of the apotheosis of Hercules, which shows the, the gods and goddesses of Olympus gathering for the arrival of Hercules after his successful labors, rising up to the, to the rank of a god. So the apotheosis of Washington, obvious comparison here. Interesting to contemplate that connection between these two individualities, Hercules and, and Washington. So without giving away any secrets of Freemasonry, we can, we can see that something's going on here. We can notice a direct line from the goddess herself connecting to the apotheosis of Washington through the, the chambers of the House of Representatives and the Senate, down all the way into the sub-basement where Washington's tomb and Lincoln's bio once stood. So Columbia, these are some little close-ups of what we saw there. This is Columbia as the Lady Liberty. And she's there at the rainbow at his feet and she's holding the, the sword of freedom. And here's Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. She represents the arts of civilization, inspiring the, the great US inventors and scientists like Benjamin Franklin. And then Circe's, goddess of agriculture. So much in these details. Here we have E Pluribus Unum. So who out there, like me, grew up with the Wizard of Oz? Right? Okay. <laughs> and, and so what a revelation to discover that E Pluribus Unum means out of many, one. And it originates from the concept that out of the union of the 13 colonies emerged a new single unified nation. So this, this Latin phrase was, the, it was actually the motto of the United States, appearing on the Great Seal for many years. But then in 1956, Congress got rid of it and adapted In God We Trust as the official motto, printed it on the almighty dollar bill. Very, very different gesture, yeah? So we have this Washington Monument. It's located at the center of the National Mall between the US Capitol building and the, the Lincoln Memorial. And it was actually once the tallest building in the world at 555 feet. The monument to America's first president still holds the title of, of the world's tallest stone obelisk. So I guess we could say that Phyllis Wheatley's prophecy of George Washington came true. And some speculate that George and Phyllis worked together in a previous incarnation during the Egyptian times. Something to contemplate. But really, I mean, have you ever wondered why we see so much Egyptian architecture? all over Washington, D.C. And, and other power spots in the world? Well, the, the Freemasons knew what spiritual science tells us, that we are now in a kind of recapitulation of ancient Egypt, the third cultural epoch. So this 
buildings or you know, these monuments, they're, they're tapping in to this ancient power. So we're gonna end this exploration with our connections with Phyllis Wheatley with this quote. Ms. Desmond, will you share it for us? In every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. Thank you, Mr. Desmond. Now we can see at the bottom here, there's a lot of these images of Columbia helping the oppressed. This feature of, of serving and healing was prevalent in Columbia's depiction. So let's back up a little bit here. Now, I, I don't feel qualified to, to make this the focus for our presentation today. But we have to bring in what we must never forget, that America was here before the Spaniards and before those fleeing from oppression came to these glorious shores, many of whom became oppressors themselves, committing genocide on the First Nation peoples and systems and slave trade. This is a vast and important topic that we must seek to bring into perspective. You know, I was, I was talking with a, uh, a native elder who couldn't be on the call today. And I, and I mentioned wondering why we don't have a definitive indigenous name for the being of America. And she said that we, we have to consider that the, the native peoples uh, consisted of many distinct tribes, each with their own dialect and customs, each working with the specific spirit of place where they lived. There was no unified country, no one name for the spirit of the land as a whole. And, and I thought that was really interesting and, and it makes sense. When we were, we were just, a bunch of us were in Santa Fe recently. <laughs> and there's no doubt that the spirit of that place is very different from the land of the wild onion where I live, Chicago, right? <laughs> so I, I would like to invite my dear friend and Central Regional Council colleague, Lisa Dalton, who is a, a, a master teacher in the Michael Chekhov techniques here to work with us now so that we can explore and, and live into this idea of spirit of place or genius loci. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So um, I wanna pick up on from where Hazel just was with our uh, native uh, indigenous peoples and the tribes. And one of the last efforts, because the tribes themselves were, had come from a period of uh, quite a bit of conflict among them. And there had grown in the, um, in the several centuries before the Europeans had this continent unveiled for them. Um, they had grown the League of the Iroquois Nation and it had grown quite a bit and it had been designed through spiritual practices and legend and myth to create what I believe is still the, the remaining law of the land and the process of the long house, the process of meeting meetings. And the fundamental unifying act that was found for healing, so I'd like to begin there, is that with every gathering, 
every gathering begins before any sort of negotiation and any sort of political, strategic, uh, social interactivity, it begins with a condolence ceremony. And so in our work, one of the images that I'm holding is that each of us is currently in a what I call a geokarmic spot, meaning you're currently in a ge geographical location, which is designed, uh, you're brought to spiritually for your karma to unfold and opportunities for you to work with your karma in relation to the place, uh, your genus loci. And that wherever that is, there has been some wounding. And the fundamental concept of this uh, idea of the condolence, beginning with condolence, is that a grieving mind cannot negotiate. And so what I'd like to do is our own little, I'd like to take us through our own little experience about where you particularly are. And the invitation is for you to work in a couple of different ways. If you would like to draw, compose, or be up on your feet, or your own method of doing this, I'm inviting you to do that. I'm gonna be up on my feet and I am going to be um, moving and you all can move as well when we do this and sound and vocalize. So the first thing I invite you to do is prepare your material. So if you're going to go uh, draw or something, grab that. If you wanna stand up on your feet, go ahead and come up onto your feet. And I'm gonna see if I can uh, see a little bit um, more of a gallery view. There we are. And to begin with, just sort of loosen up if you're up on your feet. And one of the things that's a little different than the wonderful Eurythmy Maria will be uh, leading us through um, is that in this up on your feet, it's your own thing, that whatever way you're moving is the perfect way to move. And, uh, and we have a thing called gesture, which is a movement with, a, with an intention. And, uh, and whatever way you do that, or however you draw that, or however you compose that, it has a movement in it. So it has a beginning, middle, and end, an intention to um, transform both the energy in your body, the etheric forces and the atmosphere, the cosmic forces around you. And we, we will imagine working through our imagination with our intention that we actually are able to work with uh, the, those across the threshold who may have been in your place, in your space, and you can define how large that is for you, whether it's literally the, you know, the, the acre, or quarter acre, or 500 feet that you're in, or your entire state, or the entire continent, however you would like to envision it. We're going to first condole the karmic space, the your place here. And with that, our intention is to say, I honor your right to grief. I honor your right to grieve. And so whatever that is, if we, if we just stretch our body out for a moment in a nice expanding gesture, and then bring it in very hard and tight, and you can take it down if you want, just to loosen that up. And then imagine, um, as if you have this point of your star inside the center of your chest. And this point of light inside the center of your chest is able to radiate deep down into the earth. Much, much like we maybe do when, if we're doing EAO or if we're doing some of the arrhythmia, but imagine that that light is able to stream down into the earth 
and your hands are able to, in effect, sense anything that might feel that has been harmed in the past, anything that feels it has been harmed. And what you want to do, a movement that says, I honor your right to grieve, however that is for you. It's deep in the earth, the bones of the earth. I honor your right to grieve. If you want to speak that, you can speak that. I honor your right to grieve. And you can rephrase that. I'm sorry you were hurt. I know that you were hurt. And you have a right to grieve. And what if your feet speak it too? What if your feet gesture? And we follow that now with a second gesture, which is, I grieve because you grieve. I grieve because you grieve. And here we're opening ourselves. And again, we're inviting our spiritual partners, our stars, deep into the earth and the space around us. And however that is, I grieve. Maybe for me, it's kind of a, an embrace. I grieve. I grieve with you. I grieve with you. And then if you want to follow that with, I offer renewal, I offer renewal. What is that? I want to help us heal. Any kind of phrases that awaken for you, a new gesture, a gesture of renewal, a gesture of resurrection. And then as you do that and or contemplating and listening as if your heart could speak to you, is there a call? Is there a call to you? Is somehow, is there a gesture for you that, what can you give to this spirit of place? What does it need now to bring that renewal through? The yearning to see, to be heard, to be felt in these gestures, we are opening ourselves to that. And to take that further into a moment of the, of, of the poem, what if you have a movement that is impatient of oppression? What is a movement that is impatient of oppression? It could be strong, very will-driven. It's whatever yours is, but the foot is probably involved. I am impatient. Of, a, of oppression. I am impatient of oppression. Imagine oppression somewhere and what do you want to do with it? If you could, what would you do with oppression? And pant for deliverance. What is that? To pant, to to want, yeah, what is to pant for deliverance. And then just to bring it to a close, 
going to e pluribus unum. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. A gesture for out of many, one. Out of many, one. Again, there's no right movement or thought or gesture or drawing or poetry. Out of many, one. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you, everyone. Wow, lady. Thank you. That was really, gosh, that was powerful. Thank you so much. So if anybody does, uh, if anybody wants to share anything um, uh, or, or not, if you take a moment, but if anyone has anything they'd like to share, just go ahead and unmute and uh, jump in. Yes, Richard. Okay. I have a quotation from Pirkei Avot, Wisdom of the Fathers. Rabbi and I said, it is not within our grasp to explain the prosperity of the wicked or the suffering of the righteous. All we are called upon to do is to act justly ourselves. Reality is more complex than we would like. If we insist upon it making sense, we will find ourselves despairing. Reality cannot be neatly packaged, bound with the ribbon of morality. Reality is greater than our ideas of good and evil. Reality is beyond our right and wrong. Reality is all that is, and this is often at odds with what we imagine it should be. Where we can stand up for justice, let us act. When we are confounded by truth, let us keep silent. Thank you, Richard. That was beautiful. Other thoughts, responses to any uh, anything that's happened so far? Any of <laughs> any? I think Rod has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, hi. Yes, Rod. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to share my experience with your exercise. I've been drawn to Portland, Oregon, so I feel a little bit of a an invader here. Um, wasn't sure quite the workings of this meeting and group, but uh, anyhow, here I am much the same way I found myself coming from British Columbia where I lived most of my life to the banks of the Columbia River where I currently live in Portland, Oregon. My experience with your exercise just now was the condolences to the Columbia River where I live maybe less than 100 miles from the Hanford nuclear site which is currently bleeding nuclear um, poisons into the waters and um and this state undergoes uh horrific rape of its forests which i experience regularly when i travel around this state so uh i had a lot of condolences <laughs> and um and i'm also aware of the the presence of a native people here that that watch this as well as me. So um, it was a, a, a powerful experience and I appreciate the, the concept of coming to a, a place of condolence before you can even do anything. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Yeah. Thank you. I think Eileen, you had your hand up. Did you want to speak? Yeah. Um, I'm you know, I, I took notes of what you said because I felt like this was something I really wanted to live with. So I didn't do the movements, but I, I wrote down what you said. And, um, you know, in, in our day and age, we're very used to giving positive feedback, positive thoughts, positive, but to honor, to honor and recognize 
that right to grieve and to feel that pain opens us up to something that's so much larger than we are. And, and it's another way of acknowledging in the grief another kind of empowerment. I, I'm you know, struggling to express this, but I found it very, very deeply moving. Um, and the other thing, and again, I don't know how to express this, but what stuns me is at the very inception of the United States, as was shown through the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley and the, um, the concept of Columbia as this guiding, initiating goddess, and then the visual arts showing goddesses, women at the inception, conception, and then thinking how hard it is to actually realize that in reality. And, you know, that we still struggle with this. And don't want to say anything more, just, you know, I'm kind of, uh, it's a very powerful, um, very powerful images. Thank you. That gave me the image um, to, to be aware that the, the gender, feminine gender, has a right to be grieved. <laughs> the treatment of the feminine here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Just, you know, in full disclosure, I run a nonprofit law firm and our clients are mostly women trying to protect their children, uh, victims of domestic violence and child abuse. So this, you know, really comes to me in my heart. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, I mean, Thank you very much. Yeah. It really is important to, to, to remember. And I think that that's part of why there's the theorizing convergence. Yeah. Is such a, um, yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, should we put ourselves on? Okay, so let's see. Maybe you can give uh, our friends. Let me get our video. Okay, so uh, really important to, to see that these early depictions of the, the spirit of America really holding this, this quality of the indigenous people because it lived so strongly in the land itself. And I, I love, I mean, there's so many amazing images. This one is so amazing. Look at this mythic quality. You, you see the unicorns? It's, it's almost like the Garden of Eden in a way, but with armadillos. <laughs> and I, 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 of course, this topic deserves its own, its own seminar, right? But uh, the idea of the Marian apparitions is very powerful. And specifically for the Americas, Our Lady of Guadalupe, which occurred in 1531. So Our Lady is often called the Empress of the Americas. And yeah, this, a powerful connection here with the, with the foreshadowing of the reappearance of the Christ in the etheric which for me is, is one of the main aims of the, the apparitions of, of Mary. Really opening humanity to this, this realm of the formative forces in the surrounding atmosphere of the earth. Pointing also to the future destiny of the being of America as the new Isis Sophia. So actually, you know, the entire point of this presentation for me is, is that, you know, how do we recognize the past? How do we see where we are in this present moment? How can we have this time for, you know, recognizing and, and can we see the, you know, the inequity? And then what do we want to do for the future? How do we bring in and lift the veil of this new ISIS? Because we want to focus in our time now you know, on, on, on what's, what we can do, right? We know that there, there's sexism. We know that there's racism. Oppression, is, it, it's ever raging in America. 
you know, we have societal stumbling blocks to this achievement of our, our highest human potential. You know, we can't go back to the garden, but we can, we can plan and, and create a new one. And so we see that it's, the world is, is, is moving, right, in, in an unprecedented environmental, economic, geopolitical upheaval or, yeah, I mean, face it, we're, we're still in the middle of a corona crisis. And we, we feel, we can, we all feel that there's a greater calling to turn to the spiritual connections, to ease our fears, to provide us with a sense of unshakable purpose. Because America has a great destiny to lead humanity into the future. Ideal of this motto, out of many one, right? But it's been co-opted, it's been corrupted by the 1%. So we, we need to bring it back to the unity that includes all of humanity. And I really feel like this is one of the goals of America. You know, maybe our motto should be something like, all for one and one for all, <laughs> which is what the sixth post-Atlantean epoch is all about, right? Recognizing that, you know, we have to we have to give love out into the world to have it reflected back to us as a, a counterforce to the the hoarding of the of the Almighty Dollar. So a case can be made, and thank you, Eileen, for bringing that up, you know, the, the patriarchal ideas about the divine have been responsible for many of the ills currently facing our society. So perhaps what's needed is a, a connection not only to God, but to our nation's forgotten goddess, who has many names. And as a matter of fact, images of America's divine feminine world waiting to be rediscovered, reclaimed. This strong image of the divine adorns the entrances to all of the major government buildings in Washington, D.C. I mean, did you know that D.C. stands for District of Columbia? Yeah. People ask me, you know, well, where does the name Columbia come from? Well, it's, it's written in the sacred geometry of the capital, waiting for us to reclaim it back from the, the villainous explorers, you know, to, to find the, the true essence of peace in the dove, which is the image of connected to healing and, and to wisdom, to the Sophia, and, and the power of Pentecost. Right? heralding what, what Steiner called a world witsin, to set a blaze with a sense of purpose, a pointer to the time when we will have purified our astral body to remove the veil of the new Isis of self. So if you, if you don't get anything else out of this, this begins to plant a seed for the future when we meet again in our, our next lives. <laughs> but for now, let's, let's take a little stroll around the National Mall in the Capitol. For Columbia, in her many facets, is everywhere, hidden in plain sight. We call her truth and justice, for she stands faithfully balancing the scales. She's in the, the front of the Department of Justice, actually. And she is the source of, of inspiration and knowledge displayed at the entrance to the Department of Education. She is Circe's, the goddess of new life, harvest and abundance, who offers her sheaves of wheat at the Department of Agriculture. And as we've already pointed out, she stands guard atop the Capitol building in her 
original aspect of the Native American theme called the spirit of freedom. And until recently, she stood, actually stood behind the podium of the speaker of the house. But it was, it was taken down by the Bush administration. So in, in contrast to this, when the original founders of this country, they called it the holy city and envisioned it as a temple to this goddess. Quote, the first temple dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. Nah. <laughs> about it. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I wonder what it's like for people that live in, in the Washington. You know, when you're walking around there, Patrick, I, I think you, you're, you're one of our friends that uh, maybe you take a walk over and go to the Lincoln Memorial or uh, you know, to, to live into that feng shui, to live into all of those places that we just went through um, and saw all those depictions of the divine feminine. Do, I mean, do we, uh, as human beings, we walk past things and we don't even recognize it. We don't even see it. Like it's just there, right? And so, it, and so, the, so the, this being has to appear in the clouds to try to get our attention. You know, I mean, that's kind of what happens, I think. And thank goodness it happens so that we, because we, we are, we, I think we all are asking this question, who is this being? What is she trying to say to us, to this goddess? And, and how is it that, that we as a nation have come to forget her? How come we don't see her in each other when we look, when we look at our sister's face? despite her ubiquitous presence uh, atop the nation's most prominent. So I'm hoping that we can, we can continue this conversation. You know, and, and, and as I said earlier, from the beginning, when Columbia was first revealed as the, the spirit of this land, she was seen by the native peoples as a, an Indian queen, a guardian of, of liberty, freedom, and a a generous provider of plenty. And yeah, after the colonists came to America, it's true, Columbia changes. Remember we talked about change is inevitable. Change, thank goodness we have change. She then starts to be pictured as, as wearing the, the cap of freedom. She's uh, later seen in, in the French Revolution and, and holds this, this cornucopia and the, the eagle and the, the, the rattlesnake uh, becomes sacred to her. And she is known as a, a guardian spirit. You know, in, this, in the terminology of anthroposophy, she is the archangel of the American people. So this spirit is sometimes referred to as liberty, as in the Statue of Liberty. And other times we hear of her as independence, as in the, the, the Declaration of Independence. And as the Lady of the Republic, who presided over the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, there, right? We still have a replica of the statue in, in Hyde Park. And it just, it's so powerful. You see these enactments and such were happening. It was, it's so much in the the, the consciousness. And, you know, maybe you've heard of, of the South American country, Colombia, right? And there's a, a British Columbia. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm driving home the point here that there is definitely a strong, positive egregore, a collective thought form of this archetype. Living in all of us, in the psyche. So the name Columbia is born by many beings. We heard our, our friend Rod speaking about um, the, the Great River. Right? Towns, counties, cultural organizations, ships, songs. You know, my point is the people are obviously feeling this presence strongly. 
And that says a lot as to why we call Columbia the folk spirit of America. It's not something that has been put on people. It comes out of our collective soul forces. So I, I really love, I love this image um, of the personification of the Declaration of Independence. It's the Indian queen, you know, the, the little caption here says, she rose America to be united in her states and free, sealed and signed her common wheel, for friends a home, for foes her steel, moved in the sun's rays, east and west, beneath the midnight stars at rest. Sounds like a Eurythmy verse, doesn't it? <laughs> And this other image, it's so great. It has so much uh, symbolism, the growth of industry, agriculture. We see at the bottom this broken chain, uh, an eagle, right? In the background, we got the Statue of Liberty. There's an anchor, which is a symbol of hope. And the caduceus, symbol of healing. Yeah, I just, I love all of these depictions. They, they really tell us so much about the, the consciousness of the time. And here, I threw these in, these, these powerful commercial images. We have uh, Lady Liberty coin. I don't know, I have a few of those. And yeah, you know what? Her image is resurfacing in our modern time. I know she's living strongly in my, my daughter's generation. And we can always count on the soul of the artist to bring out what's living in our collective souls. But the folk spirit who I'm calling Columbia, spirit of the original people, perceived also by the American Revolutionary, has been usurped. Her opposite in every way. I remember Steiner saying that, you know, he, something to the effect that the only thing not be forgiven is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And whenever I see this visage of Uncle Sam with his goat face, I always think of that. I don't know. And I, and I think, well, gosh, you know what? I don't want to be part of that collective karma. But the true spirit of America is a strong and beautiful peer of all the other national cultures who all happen to be personified by the divine feminine. So the American Revolution later inspired the French Revolution, which became the catalyst for their gift of the Statue of Liberty. And did you know that the, the song Hail Columbia was actually the national anthem until it was changed in 1931 to the Star Spangled Banner. This is a, a song, you know. And perhaps this was a way of preparing the consciousness of America to go to war, the Second World War, right? We call that, call that propaganda, yeah. But as the authentic potential of the American people, Colombia has hardly manifested. Her destiny, if we the people will it, is to take her back, to take back this, this divine power, to, to manifest a true land of the dove, where wisdom reigns. So I'd like to call back Richard Swirling to share these words engraved in the son of the new Colossus. Richard? Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free 
the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift the lamp beside the golden door. Thank you, Richard. Can we renew this conception in our thinking now? For the immigrant who used to be able to end their, their long journey to freedom at her feet, justice and hope are personified in her form. America's true folk spirit welcomes everyone into the New York Harbor with the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My Italian grandparents still, still, you know, they talked about seeing her upon their arrival to Ellis Island. And she offers these gifts to the world's downtrodden as they, they enter the new world seeking a new life. Well, we really don't have time to go into, but there's all kinds of wonderful uh, symbolism of the, the Statue of Liberty. You know, but I did want to share this quote from George Orwell, you know, from 1984, where he says, you know, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. So friends, let's reclaim our past. Let's you know that, and if we do that, that's going to give us the courage to love the world that we are in right now. Then we can reclaim the wisdom of America to envision and co-create a future where the spirit of these United States can, can take her rightful place in world evolution. And we can unveil the being of the new Isis Sophia as the spiritualized human being. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end my, my presentation. I, I, I just ask that we, you know, we, we cultivate that, that anthroposophia within ourselves and, and work to, to spiritualize the earth. And, and this, is, this is what the, the practice of, of biodynamic agriculture does. And I found this, this map was really interesting, uh, help us to connect to spirit of place. So... Yeah, we, we, we have our work to do wherever we are in the world. So to help us digest all that we've taken in today, I want to welcome Maria Ek, who will shepherd us. Again, she just graciously brought us through the soul journey at the Sophia Rising Convergence. And now... I'm going to ask uh, Maria to, to bring us some Eurythmy for the Verse for America. Thank you, Hazel. This has been so inspiring. The Verse for America was given to Ralph Courtney, who had been in Europe. He met Rudolf Steiner in 1906. He was a journalist with Rutgers. And or Rutgers, I don't never know how to say that, sorry. But, um, and then here where I live is the Threefold Community in Spring Valley, New York. And this verse came to him from a messenger from Switzerland by Rudolf Steiner. And it's now known as the verse for America. And I just wanna say a few more things before we try to breathe together in your rhythm. The, the, the translation of Herzen's is heart. We are, we have one heart between us, is how I've been living with this verse. This encircling round that connects us on this heart level. Now, some people worry about left and right, and please don't, except saying that your heart side is is we say on the left and this beautiful picture of the Statue of Liberty holding the torch and she has this book of wisdom held at her heart. So when we do stretch um, one way, yeah, but we can begin with our feelings and going the other way. Have, her, have from your heart the blood coming 
into the fingertips and warming your entire hand. So, so now that I've totally confused you, I have an image. Statue of Liberty has the torch in the right hand, which was known as the sword hand back in the day. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Rudolf Steiner, face to face, um, he's carving the representative of man. And there in the back, you see how it will, you know, it's what, 30, over 30 feet tall. So see how large this representative of man is, the Christ figure. And I hope you can tell that's his, his left arm that's lifted. And in Eurythmy, we do this, we call this the Christ E. From, from the heart, we would stretch and we're gonna begin with our heart side. May our feelings penetrate. Now, we'll start just with breathing and you can sit or stand and whoever wants to join in. Here I am in my studio in New York. So you can feel that you breathe into yourself. And then as you open with the sun on your back and you open and you take in the world and each other. And then you can breathe in to your heart and open to the world. May our feeling penetrate into the center of our heart and seek in love to unite itself with human beings seeking the same goal. With spirit, the spirit beings who bearing grace and strengthening us from realms of light and illuminating our love, are gazing down upon our earnest, heartfelt striving. Again, please, the threefold verse. Sorry, verse for America. May our feeling penetrate into the center of our heart and seek in love to unite itself with human beings seeking the same goal. With the spirit beings who bearing grace and strengthening us from realms of light. Realms of light, let's receive the light, are gazing down upon our earnest heart felt striving. So how can we bring this into a form? And the children call this figure eight that's lying down the infinity sign. They, they know that at a very young age. So I this 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 um Figure eight also can be seen as a soul form, with a soul lying from left to right. So place your hands on your heart, and this is my heart side, so it's opposite yours. May our feeling penetrate into the center of our heart. Now go out the other way and seek in love to unite itself with human beings seeking the same goal. Let's do that much again. So figure eight. And if you have this verse, you can try to work with it on your own, but I thought this would get us moving today. So nice figure eight. Starting on your heart side. May our feeling penetrate into the center of our heart and seek in love to unite itself with human beings 
seeking the same goal. Now picture the sun, the crown of stars on your head that we've seen. Picture the light above and just have a straight line back with the spirit beings. And again, with the spirit beings. And feel that verticality within you. With the spirit beings who bearing grace and strengthening us from realms of light are gazing down upon our earnest, heartfelt strivings. And here we can offer up our strivings from our heart. I think there's time to do it once more. Any questions? Just go ahead. You're all with me? All right, last time. Verse for America. May our feelings penetrate into the center of our heart and seek in love to unite itself with human beings seeking the same goal. With the spirit beings who bearing grace and strengthening us from realms of light are gazing down upon our earnest, heartfelt strivings. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Perfect. So we're gonna we're gonna end our session as we begin with with Lark. This time she's gonna read the the closing verse by by Alice Walker. And for those who would like to stay, we can uh, keep the space open for a little bit uh, for anyone who'd like to share any questions or comments. Mark. America by Alice Walker. We have a beautiful mother. Her hills are buffaloes, her buffaloes hills. We have a beautiful mother. Her oceans are wounds, her wounds, oceans. We have a beautiful mother, her teeth, the white stones at the edge of the water, the summer grasses, her plentiful hair. We have a beautiful mother, her green lap immense, her brown embrace eternal her blue body, everything we know. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much for being here. Hail Columbia. <laughs> and so we're gonna, we're gonna close the space now for those who have to go about their business on this, this beautiful Saturn day, the eve of the, the full moon going into an eclipse, it's a powerful time to take all of these teachings, all of these symbols, all of this, this magic waiting to be embodied through our will out into the world. But if you'd like to stay, please do. And um, I think there was a question in the chat, Maria, uh, about maybe you could talk a little bit more about the threefold verse, the verse for America. Tell us about Ralph and all those friends.
Well, I, I never met Ralph Courtney, but I did know people here. I came here in 1976, the year of the bicentennial, which was a big year in this country. And uh, I came here to study your rhythm. Ralph Courtney um, was a big part of founding this place. It started, the anthropos anthroposophists got together, those who were interested in Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science got together in New York City. They had a study group called the St. Mark's Group. And they had a vegetarian restaurant. Imagine in the 20s, this is 1920. They have a vegetarian restaurant right around the corner from Carnegie Hall, right there. I mean, yeah. Um, and, and people were carving tables and chairs, you know, to, and to look like the, the anthroposophical impulse of freeing architecture, making it um, practical and yet beautiful. Um, they wanted a farm to grow their organic vegetables. So they bought this land. Um, we're about 50 miles, I think, north of New York City. And um, they bought it as a farm to grow the vegetables. Um, and so it's been a biodynamic farm since, since then. And um, then in the summers, summer conferences started happening. The Waldorf School started in, in 1950. And then we have the, well, I don't, you don't need a whole history. So sorry, that's about all I know. Although I did find something from Virginia Seas who, who has, that's where I got the dates actually, um, that I could maybe send to. And Virginia Seas is our American who, was at, on the, the executive council at the Gertianum. So she's now, now executive council emerita. So I can send this verse with the translation and my favorite part, I'm gonna say it again, it's our heart. It's not my heart and our hearts. So I, I just, um, thank you again, Hazel for inviting me. And I'll try to send this to you if, if, if that will help others read what she has to say. Okay? Beautiful. Thank you so much. Great. If, if, is there so, anyone out there? Oh, Martha. Yes, I wanted to say that um, when we were doing the first um, things with Lisa, that I had the impulse to go and open the balcony doors that overlook the whole property here. And I am in College Park, Maryland, as a crow flies, 10 and a half miles from the Capitol. And we do biodynamics here. It's a little oasis in the middle of the city. And I could just feel that my um, connection with the land here and the spirits uh, in the cosmos and in the earth here are very powerful. And that sense of grief and grieving was, was really powerful and to acknowledge that is, is really important. Thank you. And thank you for bringing all that you brought, that everyone brought today. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it, uh, on one of Hazel's slides where she had the original uh, diamond shape, uh, speaking about the, <clears throat> um, the, the, <laughs> the spiritual geometry in the formation of, of the District of Columbia. It struck me because uh, I'm in the central region now, though I you know, lived in the College Park area for many years um, and, and the Potomac um, was a central sort of part of our upbringing in that uh, DC metropolitan area um, that uh, for now in the center, working with Hazel and the Central Regional Council, we've looked a lot at the Mississippi watershed in the central uh, nation of the region. And when when one of those images came up, Hazel it, uh, and everyone, it struck me that the the way the Potomac and, and the Bay and and everything comes together was very much a microcosm of the center of the country and the Mississippi watershed. It was very much um, 
very, very similar. And I thought that was kind of interesting uh, to imagine the district as a, uh, as, as the, it's the, it's the governmental center and it's the, you know, spiritual center of, of Columbia. And then you have this, uh, the river echoed by, in the national structure. That's just an observation. <laughs> yeah, that sacred geometry, it really digs in deep in our, our subconscious and I'm glad you noticed that. Thank you, yeah. beautiful. Anyone else have uh, anything to add, Lee? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's there's so much here that, again, you know, I'm trying to just figure out how to say a few words to point a finger at the enormity. I think of what what's going on here. The the to see reflected in the artistic depictions of Columbia and the goddess, I'm repeating myself, to see that feminine there, to see the bare breasts out of which that nourishing milk flows, you know, and, and those depictions with no shame and with reality, you know, it's reality. And to know that, that those living images inspired people. And then for me as, you know, someone who works with lawyers all the time, to become more and more aware of how a restricting, defining, confining, patriarchal influence comes in through British jurisprudence that we inherited in our legal system. That it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And um, just wanted to point a finger at this, you know, as, as an observation. Thank you for that perspective. I think uh, I hadn't thought about it in that way. Thank you, beautiful. Uh, Leon. Oh, uh, this was wonderful and uh, brought up so many things. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Uh, I wasn't gonna say anything, but then I heard about College Park and I lived there too <laughs> for six or seven years in graduate school. Mm -hmm and used the Library of Congress a lot and worked at the Smithsonian and all these kind of things, really got to know the place. And uh, you may remember Joan Allman and yes. uh, yeah. friend before she met my friend Clopper and married him. And she was in a commune where what the founder did a lot of this study of the esoteric structure of the city, F fantastic stuff. Now, um, I, I want to say something that's maybe a bit sensitive, but I always understood that this thing in Eurythmia about uh, the American verse related to something peculiar about the Mar American versus the European heart, that, our, that the feelings in America need to be brought into the heart. They're, they're kind of too much on the sleeve, as it were, too outward. And when I fa first came here, this was personified in the saying, have a nice day. Many English people found that very obnoxious and shallow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, something more sublime. Um, I almost taught at the only American Indian university founded by American Indians in the country, it's outside Davis, it's called DQ for De Dewakananda and Quetzalcoatl. And, uh, and it's my understanding that when the Americans, the founding fathers designed the system based on the Iroquois nations, They sort of went back and asked the Native Americans, what do you think? And they said, well, it's great, but where are the women? In other words, there was this structure to make decisions, but all around it were the women and they had the final veto. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so another aspect of, of patriarchy that manifests itself. On the other hand, uh, some of us 
can experience, you know, violence from the other side. <laughs> so I just want to put that out that there's a lot of people, a lot of men who are hurt very much by divorce and is the system doesn't work for anyone in a sense. Um, Maria, did you want to speak to what Leanne said about the verse? Um, yes, I have been thinking of one of the first anthroposophical doctors who came to this country. Of course, now his name, Dr. Winkler. Yes. Dr. Winkler, yes, with, um, I think they were together in Vienna, Karl Kernig, and they all each other, Jung, and, and many other names I can't think of. When he came to this country, he expected to meet maybe just Placed is the wrong word, but people who had Europeans who had, you know, replaced themselves in another spirit of place. And he said, no, these people born in this country, they have the red man soul. And I was involved with the Winkler Center out in Garden City, New York, and, and saw a lot of good work being done there. But this connection I have also with indigenous people here, um, has helped me so much because this is the land of the Iroquois nation from the Seneca to the uh, river to the Iroquois, you know, with the, yes. And, and that the women, the native people, the women were in the moon lodge and they had the prophecies and that's why they united forces because they knew a big, a big canoe was coming with flags and, and people were going to invade them. So the women were the, were the ones who carried the prophecies out of the Moon Lodge. And, and that they united something, I, Winkler wrote about how this Iroquois Confederacy was called or, or nation, that went into the, our American constitution. Maybe somebody knows more about that. It's a long time ago I read that, but it's, there's something different here for us. We're not, we're, um, I like this idea of having the red man soul. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Raj, did you have something to add? I did. Um, and it probably ties in what was just said. Um, what particularly caused me to join this morning was this mention of this Russian actor teacher and i was intrigued by the phenomena of acting out of something greater in and for me my momentary expression and not out of my head trying to i, I don't know what the the other method of acting is but it, it that's what really got me and is getting me right now considering uh, when I mentioned living 100 miles from where the first atomic bomb was born and now visiting the fact that, oh, this lovely country with these genius people that gave us this man that taught us how to act <laughs> and is one of, a, to me, a real slender th thread of good acting. <laughs> And not only that, but a way of living now with my neighbors across the street that sometimes get pretty crazy <laughs> and how to act and, and out of a, an expression that's bigger than just from here. That's, I, I, I know there's a ton more to hear from that aspect. Yeah. Not that I didn't enjoy everything else um, but it, I'm sure it all ties in. I know it all ties in. Well, if I may address it, um, Michael Chekhov um, was, was one of the original students that developed what became the method um, in Russia. And when he hit a personal spiritual crisis during the Russian Revolution in 1917, he literally walked off the stage laughing in the middle of a performance. And this was an era when he was so wildly famous that his curtain calls might be four hours long. Hmm. And he could not and he did not 
um, come back to the stage until he really dug into Rudolf Steiner's work. Mm. And because of Rudolf Steiner's work over the next 10 years, he, uh, where he began working with uh, Russian anthroposophists and ultimately met uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Steiner and uh, who ultimately directed him to not become a Christian community priest, which Chekhov was contemplating, but to stay in the field where he was. And I feel that was directly because Steiner felt or saw or knew that Michael Chekhov had something to bring forward that could only be brought through his individuality. Mm -hmm. um, his work with Steiner's work forced him to have to escape from Russia uh, because he was going to be put to death for empowering his actors. And his, the central premise was that the, the characters and the story and everything that the actor conveys pre-exists. And the training is to open yourself to receive it, to contact it, and, uh, and then convey it with such freedom, with, with so that one sacrifices one's own lower ego in order to allow it to come through so purely that each individual can receive it um, on that spiritual physical, mental, um, through their own thinking, feeling, willing forces um, and, and be moved, inspired, uplifted and healed through it. And the fundamental premise that he has uh, us work through is uh, the four brothers of that are present in all great works of art, beauty, ease, entirety, and form. And, and when one makes those the cornerstone of one's life, the um, ability to see the beauty of the form of the neighbors next door and be at ease with it allows then a kind of communion to start to unfold. And so these, and when we, uh, can gesturize the undesired state and transform it into the desired expression. We, we know the desired expression is living in the cosmic field. And we know that we're fighting these um, undesired states, conditions, uh, you know, with aramonic luciferic forces, when we can physicalize those and then transform them with the gesture into the uh, images that we're able to access, we, we can create, we can apply that technique to any aspect of our, of our world. So, yeah. Can you mention the four again, the four brothers? Yes. Um, a feeling of beauty, a feeling of ease, a feeling of entirety, and a feeling of form. So they relate to each other because if we're uneasy, it's often because we're judging a form to be ugly or incomplete and unentire. Mm -hmm. uh, if something's not complete and whole, we feel uneasy. It's unfinished. Uh, it's undone. And we yearn for wholeness. And when we don't, we're not at ease with forms, we project onto them that they're ugly. But we have an ability to look at a form and appreciate it exactly as it is in the present, mm -hmm. not based on this past and this future, but to see mm -hmm. this form. Uh, for example, when, when the, the um, technology uh, fuzzes out here, somebody goes blank, the, the, the whole system sh shuts down, um, the amount of dis-ease or uneasiness that leads to dis-easiness um, can be uh, transformed if we see that as a moment of beauty and we entice and welcome ourselves to feel at ease with that form and say at that moment that that unheard word, that frozen image for a moment is giving us some kind of gift. So when stuff isn't going well, you got beauty, ease, entirety, and form B-E-E-F, you can ask, where's the beef? 
So that's one way to remember. <laughs> we want to live with the beef. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so beautiful. Richard. Yes, okay. Three things real quick. Years ago, the uh, AGM in America was in St. Louis, and they had a map of the United States, and it had outlined the area covered by the Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, Hazel, I recommend taking a look at that because it, it's a lot to offer. The book Undaunted Courage would be a good book. The other would be to take a look at Democracy in America, uh, two volumes, well over 700 pages. However, if you read volume one, chapter 15, where he talks about the tyranny of the majority, and chapter 18, volume one, says, the present and probable future condition of the three races which inherit, inhabit the territory of the United States. It, he, he got it perfectly, and it's you know, still our, one of our main problems in America. And, and finally, uh, my coming of age time was in the 60s, and one of the questions which young whippersnappers like myself would pose to their elders was, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And it's taken me over five decades to realize that the only real answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. That's great. So true. And to be able to recognize all the parts that we play. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Well, I, I'm going to step out. You guys can stay. Um, there's actually a Mayfair going on at my daughter's school, and I want to I want to pop in there before it ends. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone and. Um, Thank you to the, the Greater Washington Branch for, for asking me to do this presentation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really close to my heart and my dear friends, all of you, Lisa and, and Maria, especially for, for bringing the team back together. So Thank you, Hazel.